Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm Dino. You know, it is cold here in Niagara Falls today. It's about minus 11. But I really feel like working on my DR650. So I want to get the carburetor off there and see if I can't clean it up and get it kind of tuned up. So why don't you sit back, get yourself something warm to drink, and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. I gotta get the heat on in here. Carburetors like this were invented all the way back in the 1800s, the 1870s, 1880s to be more exact. Now it really seems like it wasn't too far past that that Suzuki designed and built the DR650, but the reality is the current generation of DR650 only dates back to 1996. Now at that time, Suzuki decided to use the Makuni BST40 constant velocity carburetor to actually uh, induct fuel and air into the combustion uh, circuit. And overall, it works reasonably well. Most DR owners will tell you that although the bike isn't the most powerful, it's fairly reliable and the fuel mileage isn't horrible. But on further investigation, they will tell you that the bike did come from the factory jetted quite lean and this can create some starting issues in cold weather maybe it doesn't idle as well or as smooth as you'd like and the performance is obviously lacking a little bit because it just doesn't have enough fuel mixed with the air to get the most out of what the bike could actually produce now today is the first in a two-part series on this carburetor Today's video will really talk about getting the, the carburetor out of the bike, onto the bench, and taking out all of the different jets and components, inspecting them, cleaning them, and then partially reassembling the carburetor in preparation for the second video, which will be to modify it with the ProCycle upgrade kit that I purchased. Now I already have my fuel tank off of the bike, so we're going to pick it up from that point. If you need to know how to take a fuel tank off the bike, well, I have other videos you can watch that shows you how to do that. The most recent of which was how to repair the starter or how to service the starter. So go ahead and take a look at that video if you really need to know how to get the tank off. But for now, why don't we pick it up with taking the carburetor itself out of the bike. With the tank off, you can see clearly where the carburetor is, and it's held in place with two band clamps, one at the front and one at the back of the carburetor body. We also have to deal with the cables here, the choke cable and the two throttle cables, the uh, actuation and return cable, and you can see those working here as it manipulates the butterfly. Now, the manual says to undo these threaded adjusters here, put some slack into the cables, but I find I can take these two bolts out and take the whole bracket off and it saves my throttle position. I don't have to readjust it. Now this is a little bit tricky. You have to push in and use a very high quality JIS screwdriver to do this, but eventually the screws did break free for me. If you find you're having problems with this, you may be best just to use the barrel adjusters to put slack into the cables. But you can see here, I got it off fairly easy. Now what I'll do is I'll just sort of push down on the decelerator cable a little bit and then I can reach around and pull out the small little metal uh, ball here with a pick. I'll just pull it out of the butterfly here. You can kind of see it comes out easy enough. Then I'll just rotate the butterfly which gives me slack and I can pull the acceleration cable out. Now I can move the bracket and the cables out of the way and I just sort of tuck them up on the top of the frame and I'll put the screws back in here for now just so I know where they are. Next I'll use a 12 millimeter um, open-ended wrench to gently loosen off the nylon nut that holds the um, 
choke or the, the uh, plunger in for the enrichment circuit and it just slides out and you can see here the, the rubber o-ring at the end of the plunger is in very good condition it's supple and there's no sort of deformation the barrel itself is reasonably good too I'll probably scotch break this before I put it back together but overall it's pretty clean and you can kind of see here where that port is for the enrichment circuit now this line here is the vacuum line that used to go to my pet cock on my fuel tank you can see I've got it pinched off here so it doesn't draw vacuum through it and right here is the brake reservoir now the manual says to take this off to get to these two ports at the back and get these hoses off but I find I can just kind of wiggle them off without having to take that reservoir off just use a little screwdriver here and I can pry this back once that's done I'll come in and I'll undo the screws that hold these two band clamps in place and then I'll just try to wiggle the carburetor out from between the two boots it is a little bit tight to do this but it is possible I usually use my thumb to manipulate the airbox side of the grommets I just sort of push my thumb in move the move the actual grommet out of the way and then I can gently wiggle the carburetor body out slowly until it comes out and I just take your time you don't want to damage the carburetor or the rubber boots but eventually it will come out you can see it here now that we have the carburetor out I'm gonna loosen this screw here which will drain the float bowl now you can do this in the bike but I find it just as easy to do it on the bench there is quite a bit of fuel in this float bowl it's surprising and you can see it draining out through the overflow tube here eventually it drains mostly out and I'll pull off the overflow tube and I'll just tighten up the screw once I'm done here to just to keep it tight for now the first thing that you really want to do when you get the carburetor out of the bike is to start looking at it as it sits. So we want to have a good look over to see A, if there's any kind of damage on the vacuum cap here, any cracks, any damage. But we also want to look to see if there's any dirt. Now if you look right here, you can see there's quite a bit of dirt built up right around this vacuum port here. Now this can mean a couple different things one is it may have some kind of a leak here that's either been pushing out a little bit of fuel and causing dirt to stick here or it's been drawing in and causing dirt to stick around here so hopefully I'm pretty sure that's a vacuum pipe right there that pulls vacuum I'm not 100% sure but if you look here it is connected into the vacuum port that goes over to the petcock so I'm pretty confident that's what that is. So I want to make sure I keep an eye on this. I'm not sure exactly how to test it, but this could be a problem. Now if this was a two-stroke, it could be a real problem. I want to look over the general body, make sure there's no cracks or excessive wear. I want to take a look down inside the slide to make sure that there's no excessive wear on the slide. And if I cycle it, to make sure the butterflies open well, Everything seems to be relatively clean to begin with on this carburetor. You can see that I've already cleaned it once. Inside, it's not too bad. It appears like the vacuum ports here look good. Around the enrichment circuit or the choke circuit, looks nice and clean. There's no entry of any kind of dirt around here, which is a great thing. You do not want to have any dirt being sucked down all the way into that uh, port down in there and just make sure that everything seems to function well you can see I've changed out these two uh, Phillips heads or GIS screws here uh, a while ago actually so they should be relatively easy to get out but be aware that anytime you work on a carburetor like this a lot of the fasteners tend to be really frozen in place that's why it's important to use a good quality screwdriver in this case I'm using a JIS style or Japanese industrial standard many of you I know are aware of these if you don't have a set of these 
make sure to use a high quality fillip, something like this Klein here. The shape is very similar, but it's not exact. However, no matter what you use, make sure it fits inside the fastener as tight as possible and that you're putting a little bit of pressure on it as you're trying to undo them. Before you strip these out, strip any of these out, stop what you're doing. You can always put a little pair of pliers on there to give yourself a little bit of support. Now one thing I have noted is that Milwaukee impact driver screw uh, screw bits fit really well and you can use these in an impact gun lightly to break these free. You can push in and, and sort of hit it with an impact gun and these have a really seem to have a really good fit for these JIS screws. Like, I mean, it is really solid. So it's just something to think about that you may want to wrap these a couple times with a impact gun just to break them free and then walk them back out with your JIS screwdriver. But really, I can't see any discernible difference between this Milwaukee bit and this JIS bit here. But we're just being cautious. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to break this apart. Okay, I'm going to start the disassembly process by gently brushing off any loose debris that I can see here just to see, make sure I can get it as clean as possible before I really start um, working on it. And what I'll do is I'll use a little bit of brake cleaner just to give it a little bit of pre-clean here. And I'm going to just use a smaller brush here to sort of scrub some of these areas. I like to clean a little bit before I open up the, the actual body of the carburetor. And our goal here is to get it as clean as we possibly can. I'm going to also start by taking off this last fuel hose here and I'm just going to use my fuel line pliers here pop that off you can see on this one there's all of this gunge built up on here so I think what that is is the previous owner was the one who put on the safari tank and one of the things a lot of safari tank owners do is they turn this fuel pipe, they heat it up and they twist it so it lines up a little better with the way the petcocks are on the safari tank. I think what happened is when they twisted it, they probably split the pipe and they've covered this in some kind of JB weld or something. It doesn't seem to affect it, it doesn't leak, so I just, I leave that alone, I don't really touch it. Um, but I think that's really what's going on there. I think I'm also at this point going to pull off the vacuum line here. Now I'm hoping I can find a vacuum cap that will fit on there so I don't have to have that. Now this is just all plastic. You really want to be careful not to scratch or, or not scratch it, but to damage any of this and crack it. It could be very nasty. So that's the initial just sort of get the major gunge off of it. I am going to run this through my ultrasonic cleaner. I've got to change out the fluid. I'm going to use a little bit of a different cleaner in it. But overall, this is relatively clean enough for me to open up. Okay, let's do that. I'll start by draining my ultrasonic cleaner here. This mixture is 50% simply green and 50% water and this is their standard cleaner. Unfortunately it's a little bit hard on aluminum products so I'm going to drain it out completely into a decanter tray here, an oil pan basically. I'll take this to the hazardous waste depot this week. Then I'll wipe out the ultrasonic cleaner for any contaminants. Now I'm going to use uh, simply green purple mixed at one liter of the cleaner with three liters of water and that's the solution. Now I want to make one thing perfectly clear. 
you do not need an ultrasonic cleaner to do a very good job at cleaning a carburetor. Some simple carb cleaner, some nylon brushes, and some uh, torch cleaning tips, and a little bit of elbow grease, and you can do a great job. Now, if you have an air compressor, well, you can even do a better job. Just make sure that when you're blowing out the galleries, it, you're not blowing it out at 90 PSI. It only needs to be 20, 30 PSI, and most guns, you can feather that a little bit. I recommend using a rubber-tipped gun as well, just so that you don't damage anything or scratch anything. And make sure to blow all the galleries from the inside of the carburetor out. That way, if there is a little bit of deposits that are sitting within the jet galleries, you're not going to drive it down deeper into the carburetor. You're actually going to blow it out into atmosphere and clean the carb out. Now, if you're going to go and get really heavily into this, you probably should be wearing gloves. I know I often don't, but some of this stuff, Carbmatic in particular, can be a little bit drying on your hands. And if you're into it for a long period of time, it's best to wear some protection. As we take this carburetor apart, we are going to keep all the parts separated so we know exactly where they are. And any screws that we pull out that are related to fuel mitering, we're going to record those. So the first thing I want to talk about is how do you actually take all these apart? This thing doesn't really want to sit too well on any particular side. Well, the first thing you really want to do is make sure that the fasteners that you want to take out will actually come out. So I'm going to start by setting it up on the cap and I'm going to break the float bowl screws free. I'm just going to break them free so I know that when I get to that they'll come out without too much problem. Now I do know there are a couple adjustment screws on here. The first one is the actual idle screw adjustment and it is done. It has two adjustments if I remember right. It has this micro adjustment and then it also has this macro adjustment here, this larger, sort of this larger thread. So you can make major adjustments with this and then fine adjustments with the smaller internal threaded thing. You can kind of see it coming in and out there. Let me see if I can get a little closer. You can kind of see here how that actually threads in and out and gives you that macro adjustment that you want. I'm going to pull this out and clean it up. So I'm going to take this jam nut off. This is a 12 millimeter wrench. I'm just going to pop that free if I can. And then I'm going to thread this all the way out. And I'm going to leave the jam nut where it is so I get a rough idea. Oh, if it's going to let me. It may not. Yeah, it looks like the jam nut's going to have to stay. But anyway, I just want to get it out of here so I can clean this up and get it nice, nice. I probably should have counted the turns that came out of that. Realistically, I know it's going to be about um, a, a third of an inch there, maybe, maybe uh, you know, three eighths, something like that. The reality is this butterfly has to be open a little bit for this to, to really work. And it's a little bit hard to see, but wait right down inside there. Let me see if I can get a good look. See the right where the butterfly is right there? There are some ports that get opened up. The butterfly is going to sit just behind it like that, and that allows a little bit of uh, vacuum to, to come across those ports. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the top off of this. And it's held in place with two JIS fasteners. There's one. Some Makuni carburetors have four and you can see I can push down a little bit because the float bowl is still on the bottom. So I want to get these off. Now sometimes these have dowel pins under there you want to keep an eye for. Um, I'm going to pull these off. Now this is spring loaded here. I'm just going to put my finger on it. And there are a number of washers that I want to keep an eye on. One, 
two, those look the same. And as I pull this apart gently, I'm going to take a look and make sure that I'm not missing anything. So there are no dowel pins on this one. You can see the spring that pushes that diaphragm back down. And, and I also have a little plastic piece here that rides on top of the needle valve, I'm sure. So if we look on top here, we have a small O-ring, which I believe is, is replaced in the kit. I'm going to check that. We have our diaphragm and slide here, which will just lift out. And you can see there's not a lot of anything that's gotten inside into the diaphragm area. So a little bit of dirt here, but it doesn't look like it's made it past the diaphragm. Now, I don't think I have to say this, but I'm going to anyway. These can be a little bit difficult, or, or delicate, sorry. So you just want to gently wiggle it to make sure it comes out. And it should come out with the needle itself. And there it is. This looks like a factory needle. And I'm pretty sure it is because it's pretty chunky and fat. It has no adjustments on it. But it also has that little spacer that you need to be aware of. So it has a clip, but there's only one one slot in the needle for the clip. And this also hasn't been adjusted. You see down below, there's two holes. The modified slides have a second hole drilled in there to assist with the um, raising and lowering of that slide quicker. So there's a little bit, it's a little rough right in here, it's not bad. Okay, I want to have a closer look at this diaphragm itself here on the slide. Now, if this is at all damaged, the carburetor will not function properly. So when you have it out and nicely cleaned up, you're going to take the boot and you're gently, gently going to roll it in your fingers, you're going to stretch it a little bit, and you're going to look for any obvious cracking, any slices, or even pinholes that may appear in the diaphragm itself. Sometimes you can hold it up to the light and take a look through as you give it a little bit of a stretch like that. This one's in really, really good condition. Yes, the slide has a little bit of wear on it, but I don't think it's going to be anything that's going to remotely affect the performance of this. So I'm happy with this. Looking down inside of the carburetor, this is a replaceable item. <clears throat> and there's actually a pair of buttons down in there that are really hard to see. See down inside there? Right? Yeah, it's sort of really hard to see. But those slides eventually wear out, those slide boxes, and apparently have to be replaced occasionally. I'll see, I'll price that out and see what it's worth. Might not be a bad idea to replace it. But definitely, it's not too bad in terms of dirt in there. Again, I've changed this hardware out on the bowl here. That's why it's so easy to get off. Overall, it looks reasonably clean. The gasket's in reasonably good shape. And there's no deposits or anything in the bottom. So I think this looks pretty good. Before I put this float bowl into the cleaner, I'm going to pull the O-ring off very gently with a pick. Just take your time, you can walk it around, and it'll eventually come off. Now, this looks in very good shape. It's not flattened out, there's no rips or tears in it, so I'll reuse it. And I'll also take off the small O-ring from the vacuum port here, and I'll set this aside. Here you can see your main jet and down inside here will be your pilot jet. Now this should just pry out. It's a one piece float pipe unit. It looks a little bit complex but it will just pop out of here. 
Now before I take the float assembly out, I do want to measure the float height as it sits now. Now I'm going to cover this in more detail when we actually reassemble the carburetor. But basically, um, I'm just going to measure it once the float touches the needle there. See how it comes down? I'm going to hold it at that height and I'll use the tool to actually measure it. But again, I'm going to cover this in a little more detail when we get to final assembly. This plug, this blanking plug here, hides the mixture screw underneath there. And that's one of the things that I do want to accomplish with this process is to change that out for an adjustable mixture screw. All right, I want to get this out of here. So let me see, this should just wiggle out. There we go. And this will have a couple O-rings on it. And it is adjustable. Some of these are non-adjustable. This one does have a metal tang that you can actually change. In order to remove the jets, you really need a good quality screwdriver. I know this one looks a bit like a battle axe, but it really does fit the main jet very well. Now I turn it counterclockwise and then clockwise a little bit to make sure that the jet will come out. And then eventually I can just undo it with my fingers. Now there's also a brass collar that fits on here, and that sits over top of the uh, jet emulsion tube. I just push down on that tube and it will force it up into the carburetor body, which you can then just gently sort of feed through. I need a screwdriver just to poke it a little bit more, but out it comes eventually and, and you can see it here. Now the pilot jet requires a smaller screwdriver and I'll use this steel chainsaw carburetor. Uh, screwdriver and it fits very very well into this pilot jet so again I'll just wiggle it a little bit to make sure that the jets gonna come out and eventually it does I just have to tip the body over and it falls out onto the paper towel and you can see here it's in very good shape the brass tapers nice and smooth and the screwdriver slots in very good condition okay now that we have the carburetor partially disassembled or mostly disassembled, it's time to do a little bit of recording. Now, anytime you take a carburetor apart, it's a good idea to use a table to record different settings, that's jet sizes, things like that. And that's what I'm gonna do up here on my whiteboard. So basically, we have our main jet, our pilot jet, our mixture screw, our float height, and our needle height indicated on the whiteboard here. So I'm gonna go ahead and record what information that I found as I opened up the carburetor. So I know the main jet is 140 and the pilot jet is 42.5. So I'll write that on the board. And this is factory settings for a DR. So more than likely these are either the factory jets or they've been replaced with factory jets. My bike doesn't have any airbox mods yet, doesn't have any exhaust, so it makes sense that it's in a factory state. Now the mixing screw is something I'm going to look at in the next video. I'm going to pull off the cap, pull out the mixing screw, and then we'll see where it's sitting at currently, and then we can use that to adjust the idle speed um, and the low speed mixture when we get the carburetor back in the bike. So I'll just leave that blank for now. The float height I measured was a little over 13.7 millimeters, which is good because the factory float should sit between 13.7 and 15.7 millimeters. Now again, I used a special gauge. It made it way easier than trying to use, say, a sliding square, like a, a tri-square or something like that. And it's relatively inexpensive. I think I paid $23 for that tool. So I'm going to record that as 37 or 13.9 millimeters. The last thing on our list here is the needle setting. So this is a factory needle and it is non-adjustable. So I am going to put fact on there, meaning factory. The needle that came with my ProCycle kit has I think four or five adjustment slots on the needle where you can move the e-clip up or down to either richen or lean out the mixture. As we get into the tuning portion, 
we'll make records of that as well. Okay, let's get this thing into the parts tank and get it cleaned up. I'll just separate parts that I want to go in the ultrasonic cleaner from parts that I don't. Things like the floats and the gaskets and things like that. What's left, I'll load into the small basket in my ultrasonic so it doesn't get lost. And then I'll just add the main carburetor body and the float bowl itself. I'll drop it into the ultrasonic here and set it for a 10 minute scrub. It's around 48 degrees Celsius in there. And while I'm waiting, I'll clean up the idle adjustment screw here. So I'll just run it on the wire wheel and I'll get all the corrosion off of it. These look like they've cooked pretty good. But the next thing I need to do is take them down into the basement and I'll rinse them really well with warm water and get all of the chemicals off of this stuff. And then I'll come back in and blow it dry with some air. Okay, give me just a minute. Now that they've been washed and rinsed, I'm gonna take some air pressure and just dry off all of the components. Now, you could do this even with a can of compressed air that you can get for your computer. You just basically wanna get all of the moisture out of the carburetor and you can see there's quite a bit. So I'll rotate the carburetor and keep blowing in there and eventually I'll use the rubber tip on my blow gun with just a light pressure to actually clean out any of the galleries inside of there. And then I'll just finish up by drying off all of the jets themselves. I'm gonna start some reassembly here, starting with the drain bolt on the float bowl. So I'll just thread this in and tighten it down snug and then I'll reinstall the pilot jet. Now, be careful when you do this. Just thread it in gently with that high precision screwdriver and just snug it down. You don't need to over tighten this thing. Just give it a little bit of a snug. Now, before I reinstall this jet tube here, I'm gonna clean out all of these little holes. I know it's been through the ultrasonic, but I'm gonna use these torch tip cleaners here just to make sure there's no obstructions with for airflow. And I'll continue to do this. Next, you can see there's a groove on this jet tube. It has to line up with a pin right here. So I'll push it in by hand, and I'll use the back of a screwdriver to set it down in, and then finally set it with my thumb. It's not too hard, but you just need to make sure it's lined up. And finally, I'll just sort of put the gasket back in place here. Well, I think that is about as far as we are going to take the video today. I have a few more plans that I want to do in the next video with my ProCycle Jet Kit to update this a little bit. But if this is as far as you want to go, you just wanted to clean your carburetor, well really the only things that are left is to reinstall the main jet, Put your bellows back in, your needle valve, and then button up the vacuum cap on top. And then just put the carburetor back in the bike. Now, if like me, you were able to get the, the actual throttle cable plate off of here, then that means your throttle free plate will be exactly the same as it was before you took the carburetor off. If not, I'll post the cable free plate somewhere up in here for you to see. I'll look it up in the manual. But I do encourage you to get out in your shop and tackle something like this. It doesn't have to be the carburetor, it could be any part of the bike, but it's really a fun part of the hobby and it's something you can do. It's not hard, it just takes some time and learning and those skills, well, they carry through to other projects in your shop. Well, I've had a great time, I hope you have too. Please keep the comments coming and I'll see you again soon here on Dino's Tinker Shed. This looks really, really clean. It's like a piece of jewelry right now. Bye now.